Submitted for your approval. A small town civic organization. They call themselves the Coronado Rotary Club. And they meet on Wednesday afternoons in Coronado, California. And here to kick off this week's meeting is our pledge and invocation grantor, past president, Tom Mitchell. Hey, hey, let's stand up for this. First of all, I want to say this is going to be one of the more brief invocations. However, this is going to be an exercise in your memory, okay? So, first, what we are is God's gift to us. So I want you to repeat that. What we are is God's gift to us. What we become is our gift to God. What we become is our gift to God. Amen. Okay, let's do our pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Thank you for that inspirational message, Pastor Tom. And now to introduce guests and visiting Rotarians, here he comes, our most favored past president, Dan Orr. Slow it down, Dan. Slow it down. Okay, your, mo your most favorite past president screwed up and forgot to check if there were any visiting Rotarians. So if you're a visiting Rotarian, please uh, raise your hand. And, uh, well, in that case, I'm saved. Guess a Rotarian, my left, your right. Guess of Rotarians. President Bob, fellow Rotarians and uh, guests. This is my wife, Judy Weissman, who is uh, chairman of the Coronado Hospital Foundation. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I'm here with her team. to introduce my special guest for my second time, Shannon Pavel, who has just accepted the director role for Coronado Hospital Foundation. Welcome, Shannon. All right, that it? I'm out of here. Put a fork in it. Put a fork in it. See if you can get your jet. All right, he didn't say it, but I've gotten used to saying, put a fork in it. Okay, and you Red Badgers, if you're a Red Badger, would you please stand now? And I will, as I read your name, you may wave your hand and then be seated. David Gardner, there he is. Brenda Jones, hey Brenda. Kathy McDonald, hey Kathy. Brian Smock, he's probably still at the Masters. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, get, we'll catch up with him momentarily. Marty Tribe, there's Marty. And Bob Weissman, we've already heard from. Welcome, you guys. Did I miss any? There's not a lot standing. Well done at the front desk. Okay, let's uh, go to announcements. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, coming up, Flags on the Avenue. Uh, this will be this week on Thursday, up at 7, down at 6 uh, to... Support the uh, teal, SEAL Team 3 Memorial. Our alternate meeting is uh, going to be on the 25th, 6 p.m. That's going to be a lot of fun. Tammy Sankey will be speaking <laughs> and giving us uh, a... Uh, in fact, I'm not going to say any more about that because I have a whole slide for that. Keep that in your back pocket. Rotarians at work, and I'm going to offer 30 seconds here for our esteemed Rainier. 
Thank you, President Bob. So fellow Rotarians and guests, we have Rotarians at work 10 days a week. That's on Saturday. It goes from 8 to 12. We have it at YMCA Camp Surf, San Pasquale Academy, and here at the Coronado Schools. So uh, Jamie had previously sent out a registration link. If you haven't yet, please sign up. This is an all-hands event. And for those who are going to San Pasquale Academy, we are going to be having some carpools. We will be meeting at Sprinkles Park at 7 o'clock at the corner of 6th and C, and that'll get us to San Pasquale by 8. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll send out an announcement. Yes, ma'am. Rainer, if we signed up on the sheet, that you pass around. <laughs> yes, that's great too. But I'll also send out another registration link for those who may have missed it, and I'll send out the instructions for the, uh, the meeting points and the carpools. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Rainer. Some of us are actually going down to Ensenada. Luann and I think Jane. Anybody else going on that trip? Uh, okay, we're going to have some fun down in Mexico doing our Rotarians at work down there. Okay, now let's go to an expanded look at the alternate meeting because this is going to be excited, so exciting. Excuse me. Past President uh, Suzanne Pop will be presiding and Tammy will be speaking and she'll be covering everything you ever wanted to know about creating an estate and making it work for you. So. Uh, if you want to hear that, uh, sign up. 20 bucks uh, on Thursday the 25th. Starts at 6. And uh, adult beverages and pizza will be served. Next slide, please. Okay, if you enjoyed the, uh, the music competition uh, club-wise uh, and then at the... Uh, at the wind room uh, a couple weeks ago. You'll definitely want to go up to Carlsbad and see the district finals on April 20th. And if you want uh, any more information than that, it's all up here, but it's also duplicated on the district website. Okay, next slide. Well, I tell you what, I was excited actually to see Dan Gensler come join us today. Dan, we have, we have had so much in our hearts over the last week and a half. And and it's just, I know everybody that had a chance to see you today was uh, was really buoyed by by having you. So I think you said you wanted to say something. Thanks, President Bob. I just want to um, say thank you to all of you. Um, the kind messages, text messages, the cards that you sent, the heartfelt cards, the prayers. Uh, and the prayers and the prayers that continue to come. Uh, the love that I felt from all of you in the room. It's, uh, this is a, was a surprise for Chris and I when the diagnosis came in January. And uh, I wouldn't recommend chemo to any of you. Uh, but I have to say the love and the support that, that we've received has, has been overwhelming. It's, uh, I don't know how to say thank you. It's just really touched our hearts. And uh, we're so grateful for all of you, and, and, uh, and thank you for that. Thanks, President Bob. Well, as you know, we, we have this, um, this uh, meal train set up, so before you think it's too much, you might want to see what it tastes like. <laughs> all, I'm, I'm proud to say as a club that all the dates uh, going into June have been filled, so uh, thank you all who have uh, volunteered and signed up to provide a meal for for Dan and Chris. Okay, next slide. Spring fashions are on sale, and they're out there right now. Be fashionable for the spring. See Sue and Marty, they have some great stuff. Okay, next slide. If, uh, if you're interested in, in the lifeblood of, of Rotary, which is membership and growth, uh, this is a great district training opportunity. And, uh, and it's easy just to zoom into it. You just go, you register on the district site, and uh, it's on a Saturday, so uh, get a cup of coffee and, and enjoy that. Next slide. Uh, a couple of safer dates coming up now. Uh, Low Tide Ride and Stride is on the calendar now. They've had their first organizational meeting uh, on Monday, and uh, we're off and running, so June 23rd. Uh, Put it on your calendar, and uh, oh, we have that's a different slide. Okay, yeah, good enough. Never did. Yeah. All right. Oh, got it. Next slide. 
Okay, and we're also uh, scheduling now uh, the End Polio Now wine tasting event for September 6th, so put that one on your calendar as well. Next slide. Okay, let's have a little fun. Uh, happy anniversary, Suzanne. Where are you? Ah, well, please please come up and join us. So we're, we, we, we do want to play a little trivia here if we can. Uh, Let me look at this first. Suzanne. Well, I'll, I'll be happy to audible these for you. Uh, so what, the first question is, what, what is your uh, induction date? Uh, April 20th, 18... No. <laughs> Uh, 2004. 2004. So that would so this would be your 20th anniversary. 20 years. Wow. Okay. And do you know why I I wanted to tell you one little thing. My very first, you know, when you come in and you're a guest, so you don't really know uh, the procedures. So Dan Orr, Dan the man, was the uh, president of the Rotary Club then. You're getting ahead of yourself, but that's okay. <laughs> Well, and um, and then I learned he was the second president to shave his legs. So, and then Suzanne Pop. And we're hoping it stays that way. <laughs> <laughs> Trivia question. Who was, who was the first? Trivia question. Who was oh, Suzanne first? Pop. Uh, then who was the third? Uh, Mary, Mary Griffin. Mary Griffin. Yeah. You're missing. Who was the first or the third male president? To say? Male president. Shaved Who's him? running this trivia? <laughs> You'll get the microphone in a minute here anyway. So. And then Suzanne Pop at this meeting threw a roll at Dan Orr, and I said, this is the club I want to belong to. This is my tribe right here. So who, who was your sponsor? Well, uh, Doug Weisbarth was like a co-sponsor, and Deanne Tiffany, who's a lovely artist. Okay, and we've, and we've already established that Dan Orr was the president. Is that your final answer? No, no, oh. Steve Dermeyer was the president. That was his best years when he inducted me. He's not here to dispute that. I can't so. argue with that. No, that's good. Okay. And the final Jeopardy question, actually in the form of a question, not an answer, is... Does, does does he know, Elton John, does he know that, that you've been rifling around in his kitchen drawer? No, it's his drawers. Oh, that is, he doesn't keep his drawers. These are, these are Elton John's glasses. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I like that. you got to have fun. And this club has a lot of fun. All right. Now, you've taken up a lot of time up here. All so it's going to cost you. Do, you. do you have a recommended uh, uh, penalty here? Um, well, I'd like, how about... Two hundred dollars to the Our Club Foundation for my twenty years. Well, that's uh, that outstanding, okay? and come back in another twenty years. I right. love the way you celebrate. <laughs> Congratulations, Suzanne. Okay, and uh, next slide. Around town, what did we do in the last? We we all would, we kind of paid attention to our favorite basketball team, the Wolfpack. Of course, these guys are with us on every uh, every. Fourth of July to, to move our float along. They uh, were doing well. Next slide. And let's see. This is uh, this is a really cool thing. Thanks to to Roger Clapp and, and Ron Vernetti and and Bob and Mary Griffin. And they uh, they went and took all this pizza over to uh, Fisher House, and and uh, they were very appreciative over there. So well done on that. Thank you, team. Next slide. Beach cleanup, wonderful out. We're uh, uh, showing for uh, for our monthly beach cleanup. Thank you, team. Next slide. Some of these folks went on and uh, did a little help for the flower show, which is coming up. If you drive by the park, you'll see the tents already up. And uh, thanks, Roger and Sarah, and uh, and two red badgers getting a community service check mark. Uh, <coughs> Kevin Kenny and uh, Bob Leisman. Well done, team. Next slide. I think we have some snapshots from Father Joe's this morning, do we not? We don't? I dropped them. Well, it was so early that there wasn't enough light to take the photos. Okay, that's, that doesn't pass the four-way test. In fact, there were tons of photographs and they were all... This event took place uh, starting at 5.30 this morning and a lot of folks... Could, can I ask the people that participated in that then to stand up so we can see what it's like to burn the candle at both ends? They've all been up since 
five. We're past earlier than five o'clock. I think the carpool left at five thirty, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, and we will get those photos in uh, in next week if we can. We're going to have the speech contest next week, but uh, but I'll try to uh, have those on a on a uh, on a loop. Anyway. Um, the second piece of this is that uh, Ron Bernetti, uh, who, who is one of our uh, most uh, esteemed, uh, you know, contributors to the wellness of this whole community and the, and the expanded community around Coronado, has uh, has a seat or has a table for ten at the gala on May 18th. And Ron's not going to be able to go, but uh, but he's offering that up. Anybody that would like to take advantage of that at no cost. Uh, would you see Ron, and, and he would love to have you represent us at at the uh, Father Joe's Gala on the 18th of May. Okay. All right. Do you guys do you want to say anything more about that, Georgia or Ron? Um, uh, I know I did my two of mine um, about a couple weeks ago, and I told you I was. Wait, wait. Give the mic. So when I did my Who Am I uh, a few weeks ago, I told you I was in between jobs. Um, I just started working at Father Joe's Villages. So I started last week. Um, and so Ron has been an amazing supporter and he um, is gonna be offering that table. So um, I would love to have some Rotarians at that event so that we can have some fun together. Um, May 18th uh, at the US Grand Hotel. So if you're interested, let either of us know. Thank you, Georgia and Ron, very magnanimous. Okay. Now, every once in a while, people ask me, "Hey, can I uh, can I make uh, can I talk about this or that?" And I go, "Well, is it is it a Rotary announcement?" Well, it's not officially a Rotary thing, but it has a lot of Rotarians involved in it, and it's a very you know community focused thing. So I'm opening this up for a couple of announcements today. And Suzanne, if you want to kick that one off with the uh, Village Elementary Biz Town interview announcement. These, these non-rotary announcements come really cheap. They're only $25 a minute. So the clock is running. And by the way, you can roll right into the flower show if you want to. So the $200 doesn't come? Yeah, I, I, think, I, think, I think we will, actually. I think, I think as a dividend, uh, you're, you're allowed it, uh, two minutes to talk about, okay. the, about, this, about, about uh, this town and the flower show together. So for many years, many of our Rotarians and our police and our leaders in the community have uh, gone to BizTown. It's they, we interview fifth graders to get a job, so they come in and uh, we just interview them and, and talk to them and they tell us what they do and why they want the job. And, and it's a really fun thing. These kids are just so great to be around 10 year olds. Uh, so if you're interested, Crystal Gardner at the Village Elementary, or I can take your name and just send it to her and she can send you information. So it's um, May 1st, Wednesday, 8.15 to 9.30. So it's a real quick, quick, fun time. So if you're interested, please let me know. Thank you, Suzanne. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna go into a real exciting presentation now on Crown Fellows with our good friend Jane. recognized for their contributions to the endowment fund of the Coronado Rotary Club. So this fund grows from the donation of our club members <coughs> and also some of the proceeds from our fundraising events are, are given to the, the fund. Annually we take a 4% distribution of the fund balance and this is used to support causes within our community <coughs> the la last year the amount of our distribution was 17,000 and our distributions to date have totaled $164,000 so you can see um, today the balance in our endowment fund is $646,000 and then by our 100th anniversary in March of 2026, our goal is $1 million. Uh, and when we reach that level, 4% 4, 4 of that is $40,000 that we would get on the $1 million every year. 
So uh, think about that over the next two years to try to help us get it up to a million. And I know we can do it. We've made great progress in just in the past year. <clears throat> next slide. Next slide. Um, so there are various levels of giving within the Crown Fellow designation. There's the level one Crown Fellow uh, with donation of $1,500, and you receive the gold, um, 14 karat gold pin. And then there's the level two Crown Fellow, um, $5,000, and you receive a banner with one diamond chip on it to, to put with your pin. Level three at 10,000, a second diamond is added to the banner, and then a level four at 25,000, a third diamond on the banner. Oh, next slide. So today we're going to honor our newest Crown Fellows who have contributed at least $1,500. Uh, so would you please come up, Carol McClellan, Karen Laidline, and Paul Laidline. Come forward from behind the banner. Either works. to the endowment or the, in the past years. So if you're wondering where you might stand um, level-wise, let Jamie or me know and we'll figure it out. So thank all of you. Thank you, Jane. And just a reminder uh, that you know non-rotary announcements, uh, come see me, 25 bucks a minute <laughs> goes straight to the endowment fund and I, I, I don't discriminate. You can you can talk the whole time if you want to. All right, the last thing before we hear our most exciting stand-in uh, presentation is going to be a, a, a check to the Coronado Hospital Foundation. So, Nora, if you'd like to have the whole team come on up and and we will do the check presentation. <laughs> Thank you, President Bob, fellow Rotarians. I just wanted to introduce the wonderful Sharp Coronado Hospital and Coronado Hospital Foundation team. We have Judy Weissman, our esteemed and very, very, very capable leader, who, um, and she was instrumental in finding my replacement, Shannon Pavel. Shannon, congratulations. And we have our very own Sharp Coronado Hospital executive, Pod Benjalil, who is our COO, CFO. So he knows the answer to all of the questions, <laughs> clinical 
construction, all of them. And thank you to everyone in the room who serves on the Coronado Hospital Foundation board, in addition to all of the many donors, both Rotary and Coronado Hospital Foundation. talk while she's presenting the check. It's on behalf of uh, Coronado Rotary. We're more delighted to be able to offer this uh, this grant of $12,500 to the Coronado Hospital Foundation. Okay, and I will add that I got wind of this these endowment funds, and that's why this check is so big. So thank you guys all who support the endowment. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to the community, to the Rotary Club. Uh, this hospital was built by the community, for the community, and it's still here because of the community. And we're looking forward to the next 30 years of the hospitals for the community. So stay tuned, more to come, but we're very excited about the future of the hospital. So we'll be sharing some information very soon. Uh, the last thing that you've heard from us was probably that we had our primary stroke certification, which means that now if anybody comes to the hospital with stroke symptoms, they can get taken care of and will stay within our hospital uh, and only get transferred to a sister hospital if there is any need for procedure. So we're very excited about that for the community. But again, this would not have been possible without all of you guys here. So thank you so much. Okay, so today you, you get to a, a bird's eye view of how we do business in the Coronado Rotary when, when things change. And we had originally planned to uh, have the Dean of the College of Engineering from the University of Arizona uh, give a, a very interesting talk on, on the uh, portfolio that they operate on the academic side at that great institution. Um, but he offered his, uh, his regrets on short notice uh, late last week, and, and I couldn't share with you why that was at the time, because it was still close hold, but it, uh, any of you who have followed some of the, uh, the press that's uh, come out of the, of the University of Arizona related to, the, uh, to some of their financial uh, mismanagement, uh, that has basically caused the president of the university to have a shortened tenure as a result. So the Dean uh, has been impaneled by the Board of Regents uh, on, to serve as a part of the selection uh, panel to pick a new president. And that started this morning and it was announced uh, uh, this morning as well. So I can share that with you now and that is why we are exercising what we do actually very well which is respond to change in the Coronado Rotary and we tap into people on our bench who happen to be Rotarians in residence and have very very ex exciting and interesting life experiences that, that we actually find very interesting and and so such is the case today because uh, past president Bill Sankey who's actually I think this is the second the second presentation he's get, given in the past uh, uh, two months, because he did address the uh, uh, alternate meeting with an exciting and interesting uh, uh, presentation as well uh, last month, but uh, but he's more than happy to step in. And uh, and if you like uh, stories about airplanes, especially vintage airplanes, you're really going to like this story. Um, and he is going to tell us uh, about a visit that he took to the United Kingdom and uh, a little uh, walk through the Imperial War Museum at Duxford, and, um, and then some, um, some chatting about how we keep Spitfires. I think the flying today, is that correct? Okay, um, at, a, at another airfield in the UK where they, were, uh, where they originally flew out in support of the Battle of Britain. So with no further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to past president uh, Bill Sankey and simply say thank you, Bill, for stepping in uh, on short notice and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Bob. Best introduction I've had all day. <laughs> Just to close a loop on an earlier comment, the other past president who did shave his legs, the male one, 
was one trying to avoid the roast committee bringing him to the stage for his roast, Mr. Dan Ginsler. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, also he put on a dress. We couldn't find him. He came as a visiting Rotarian dressed like a witch. One of the classiest things the roast committee's ever had to do. Hey, Bill, Bill, I tried to get a date with him. <laughs> and you succeeded, I think. No love, no love. Um, anyway, for those of you who came, thank you very much. I hope... Uh, Appreciation for aviation is important for this program. If you don't like airplanes, there's a back door there, a back door there. Um, and for those of you that are seated over here where you can't see the screen very good, this is a very visual presentation. I have two um, fast-paced two-minute slideshows and two three-minute videos that I will share with you during this presentation today. It has uh, five elements to it. The first part is Duxford and the Historical Museum there, and my coming to Duxford, why how I ended up back there, uh, having been there first in 1977. Um, we'll take a look at the Air American Air Museum, which is at Duxford, and it's a hangar specially built, and it has more um, airplanes in it than a can of sardines has sardines in it. It's quite amazing. <laughs> the British Air Museum is also a hangar we'll visit, and, uh, and then finally, keeping history flying is something that is tremendously culturally important to the British. Um, their visceral experience during World War II is felt today when you go to the War Museum. The Battle of Britain Air Show, which I attended over a two-day period in September of last year, really brought that home for me. The, 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 really, the spiritual connection that these, this generation has with the previous generation. There's even a slide in here of four guys who flew Spitfires and Hurricanes just walking down the street like this. And they're not heroes. And you talk to them, they aren't heroes. They just simply did their role. The Battle of Britain was only a couple months long. Um, and actually the biggest uh, aircraft winner of that time was the Hurricane, not the Spitfire. But of course, the Spitfire gets all the press. And that, at the conclusion of my remarks, will be, um, I'll take you on a three minute ride uh, in a Spitfire, which actually bills out, if, it, if the three minutes bills out about $1,000 a minute for the video, which is what it costs to, to fly in that thing. And it go, that money goes to support the creation of maintenance programs and historical um, uh, presentations that, that, that fulfill the need to keep these planes flying. There's about 70 or 80 of them still flying. They're nearly 80 years old now, and, uh, and the people who work on them, you'll see some slides of those folks, the people that fly them, uh, are, are just absolute gems of individuals. Um, and, and, and it's not climbing Kilimanjaro, Natalie Bailey, but, but it's still pretty cool. And so um, please join me on, as I share my vacation slides with you. Um, flying over the English countryside, uh, Duxford, which is the RAF um, base that was very close to where we live while my father was stationed at Mildenhall, England from 1975 to 1977 for his command tour at the Naval Air Facility. I was in sixth, seventh, and eighth, eighth grade, and the school I attended for seventh and eighth grade is the same teacher that the Lane Lines, the same school that the Lane Lines taught at in England. That's a tremendously small world experience. They connected me with one of their current teaching friends, and we got to go by my old house, we got to see my old school. It was really a really great trip down memory lane. Go ahead, next slide. Um, the Imperial War Museum has three parts to it. There's the, the war chambers downtown in London that, that, um, that Churchill operated out of. There's another airfield, and then there's Duxford. So this picture is my first foray into aerial photography. I'm leaning out the side of an open cockpit T-21 glider, and I'm looking down at Duxford. Now you're gonna see in one of the slides later, this DX and the air hangar is exactly the same as it was. This plane with the yellow stripes is still there. There's a couple airplanes that are still there. All these hangars still have work in them, and the bigger hangars here and here, their newer construction, have been ex expansions of the museum over the years. So this is 1977, and I went back uh, last year in 2023. Um, next slide. So this cute little blue thing here is Bluebell. I'm at the controls of that glider, and I'm about, I don't know what, 10 or 11, 12 years old, give or take. That's the other one of the two that were part of the glider club. Another odd Coronado connection here, Crown School. My fifth grade teacher was a lady named Nora Wenz. Anybody go to Crown School and know Nora? Okay. No, did you know Nora? You knew Nora. So, you talk with Nora. So Nora's brother, Rich, was the head of our youth center at Milnall. And he was an active participant in the Slider Club. So I said, hey, would you like to come out? I said, yes, and I went a couple of times. It's a great time. Small, weird, real world, small work connection for the brother of my fifth grade teacher is now taking me to gliders. Next slide, please. So the Battle of Britain Air Show took place over a weekend in September of 2023. They have three special events during the year, and then on, on any given weekend, you can go to see the museum, and they'll have two or three planes flying, depending on what's going on. It's a very active place all summer long. In the winter, they button everything up, they've got big giant hangars, they do maintenance on all the aircraft. Whether it's rebuilding engines, working on wings, 
In the last slideshow, you'll see some uh, maintenance slides of guys working on these things, breaking them down, taking every, all the cables out. I mean, they really take great care with these things. Now, the, the one I flew in had a, an instrument panel that shook like this. <laughs> and you'll see in one of the videos, I kind of grab it to hold it to, to make sure it's not going to fall off. And it did. But, uh, but anyway, they do show their age a little bit, but they're awfully fun. Um, next slide, please. So the, this is the first slide show, right? I think it is, yeah. Um, it's two minutes long, it's quick, and it, this is a picture of all the pictures that all the aircraft that were along the flight line, some crowd shots, over 33,000 people attended this show over the weekend. So please enjoy two minutes of some really cool aviation pictures. Fires, a lot of hurricanes, and a lot of people. That's why they called it the Spitfire. Notice the yellow stripes on that plane. Lycoming, used by special forces during World War II. We saw the DX, same DX, nothing changes. American hangar on the right hand side of the slide. Unique wing shape of those beautiful Spitfires. First jet operational from a carrier for the Brits there. That's a very famous stainless steel Spitfire that you can actually Google up and see online. Um, after um, 46 years, I got to go fly in over Duxford in a Tiger Moth, which is a, a, a fabric winged um, the biplane that was a trainer for them. And the guy flying the plane is a hoot. So I left a lot of the audio in. So listen to him because he's really funny. Um, I got out of the plane at the end of the flight thinking the guy was in his maybe 40s or whatever. The guy's probably 75, maybe almost 80. He has just got so full of fire and spunk. He drops a few curse words in, so ladies and just a fair warning. But he's a hoot, I'll tell you. So um, pay close attention to the audio, especially his stories. Uh, go ahead, roll the video. It's, uh, compared to a Cessna, it's a crap airplane. <laughs> um, uh, he's dissing on my Cessna. Uh, you've got the Yale and you've got Stearman and stuff. Um, we, this was our primary trainer at the Second World War. Uh, the Commission packing on a request taxi, one car to the for you pilots, we're doing about an 11 or 12 knot crosswind, and our call sign is classic 9. Brilliant. And I was the last flight of the day because it was getting windy. And when you watch the landing video, you'll get a kick out of that. <laughs> Tail flies first, and then uh, up we go. And you 
remember from that earlier aerial photograph, you can look over here on the side and see how much the machine is off. Notice who turned right. None of this John Wayne crap. So it was gusting to 18 knots uh, crosswind by the time we got down. Tender little thing. I'll tell you what, Steve, uh, as a pilot, I appreciate that technique. I don't think your uh, your left slow passenger would, would know what to come down that way. <laughs> well, you'd love it, so it was a display. And I looked at the upper deck, up the lined up, and it was horrendous, much worse than this. And I'm thinking, shit, I'm going to land this thing. <laughs> As only a pilot can appreciate the, the people watching you do your landing. Um, that was a real treat, and Steve was a real cool guy. Um, next slide. Uh, the American Air Museum has uh, everything from a U-2 to a B-52 to an F-4. Um, there's a lot of World, World War II bombers in there, and uh, go ahead and advance the next slide. Um, it's quite amazing how close you can get to these aircraft because it's a two-story hangar and you, there's a deck you walk around. But you're basically walking around underneath these things and they must have packed way too many. I mean, it's, it's really amazing how they fit them all in there. Um, you got World War II aircraft, uh, you got the SR-71, there's you two, next slide please, hanging from the ceiling. Um, any F-4 drivers in here? That airplane got a lot of uh, attention from the folks in there. Um, next slide please. Um, the very famous P-17, who's watching Masters of the Air? Anybody watching that beautiful story about the World War II bombers that flew from East Anglia, these same bases? Um, the folks that were smart in the Pentagon thought that bombers with machine guns on them could win the war. And two years into the war, they figured out that wasn't working very well because we were losing a lot of people. Um, they came up with the Mustang, and they flew the Mustang with these guys, and the Mustang didn't have the horsepower or the uh, turbocharger to get to the altitudes the bombers had. They put the Spitfire engine in the Mustang and turned it into a real airplane changed the war. So it's funny, when you hear both planes flying by, they sound completely different, which has more to do with the propellers than anything else. But by putting those Rolls-Royce engines in those, uh, in those Spitfires, made a difference in the war and helped us win, basically. Um, and World War II, when you think about the Battle of Britain, uh, that was so short because the Brits stopped the Germans, and then the Germans got busy with other things and decided not to invade. So if the Battle of Britain hadn't happened, perhaps the Germans would have invaded Britain, which would have been a whole different outcome, I think, for the war. So being a part of this is really, really cool. Next slide, please. Uh, again, just really cool airplanes, uh, all American airplanes. So there's a reverence for America um, that's really, really cool, but of course they also appreciate their own aviation. But British aviation designers work differently than American aviation designers, and you'll see some examples of that soon. Next slide, please. British aviation has a... Uh, uh, to put their air inlets on the wings of the airplanes, like right in by the body of the wing and the, and the airplane. Go ahead, next slide. Um, and they also do weird things like put three engines on a two-engine airplane. 
that plane used to take you to the Channel Islands, but I always thought that was one of the weirdest looking airplanes. It has been at that museum for a long, long time. Next slide, please. Um, the Gannett, a very famous ASW aircraft with two props that spin awkwardly differently directions to other take care of uh, flying. Um, that flew for about 10 years, a very popular airplane. We had one in the U.S. at the very end of World War II that we tried this with and gave up on it pretty quickly, but the Brits are kind of pig-headed. They said, we're going to make this work. And they did, like I said, for 10 years. Next slide, please. Um, in the British hangar, there's uh, old British uh, BOAC aircraft. Remember, they were doing uh, jet airplane stuff right before we got the 707 going. And then that's Richard Branson's um, Around the World uh, balloon. Um, what did you call that? Balloon box, whatever. That was his cockpit, I guess. Um, and you see first example of those inlets right by the, by the fuselage of the aircraft. We did that once with our F-100, but got away from it pretty quick because I understand it. Next plane. Next slide, please. Again, more examples of the Brits and their kind of unique way of, of doing things that they can't get unstuck from. They keep doing the same thing over and over again. Um, next slide, please. And the most famous bomber, any James Bond fans out there? Do you remember the, this bomber in the James Bond film? It crashes with the nuclear bomb inside it and they go ding. Anyway, that's the Vulcan, very famous aircraft. I saw it fly in 1976. Um, it makes the most amazing noise, but again, they can't get away from putting their inlets in the right place. Um, next slide, please. So the preservation of aviation history is something that Duxford does very, very well. There's some private concerns at the north end of the runway, a ARC Aviation Restoration Corporation, where private owners give their airplanes to these guys all winter long and they get worked on. Um, and they, they, again, completely remodel them, completely redo them, build, rebuild everything from engines to landing gear to control surfaces. It's really amazing what they do. And the old guys, tell this guy's telling me a story about the Blenheim, which is this airplane. It had a problem with the fuel pump. They actually had to take the whole engine off to get to the fuel pump, which I thought was a very poor engine design, but that's how they did it. That plane is now flying this summer after having been completely rebuilt. Next slide, please. Um, walking around the flight line, you see these guys dressed up telling stories about their, uh, about their, their wartime and, and the fascination of the children and, and adults as well is, is palpable. Four old coaches walking down the play, just, just doing their thing. They have a very uh, strong tradition of continuing to wear their squadron regalia and their, and their, uh, and their uh, decorations, but they're very quiet and humble people. I walked up and they were nice, but they didn't want to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> next, next slide, please. Um, so one of the things that's really, really cool about these kind of air shows, and there are some in America that do this too, but they really get down and dirty with the costumes. And so for the press photographers who can come a little early, they have a whole kind of, they'll, they'll like simulate uh, uh, a call from the, the air command to get in the air and they'll run guys across the runway. And it's really fun. And it happened at seven o'clock and I didn't get to either of them on the two days because it was way too early in the morning. Um, but I was able to capture this to get the feel for it. Next slide, please. So we're in the hangar at the place um, where I flew Spitfires, and this is uh, part of the, the fact that they do all this maintenance on these things, but there's young people getting fascinated into this, into this whole field. Um, there's a whole summer volunteer opportunity that a lot of people who are into aviation do, and they fly with these folks all summer. Next slide, please, I think. Yeah, we're sliding, it's slide time. from the movie, that was about. Merlin? All new metal fabrication for wing spars. Couldn't resist the playful stuff. Very rare formation flight with a B-17 and a B-24 Lancaster. That's an original Messerschmitt one. There are only the couple left in the world. One of 
one of the coolest lines in military aviation. That's bending metal for the shape of a wing. So most of these aircraft are privately owned, and they uh, they have guys fly them, or some of the pilots are themselves. Okay, I'm in the, I'm in my hotel in Cambridge, England. It's Tuesday morning. I'm supposed to fly the um, Spitfire on Wednesday. And they call me up and they say, hey, it's going to be bad weather tomorrow. Can you get here? Now, I'm two hours north of London, and Biggin Hill is an hour south of London. So it's 10 o'clock in the morning when I get the phone call. By 1.30, I'm at the airfield. A train from Cambridge to London, another commuter train from London to, uh, to I mean, you got to love the public transit in Britain. Anyway, it's fantastic. So the aircraft I'm going to fly is this Grey Nurse. They have two Spitfires that they were running that day. Um, again, original 1943 aircraft, um, they're flown uh, quite regularly with great maintenance um, and with great care. So I think, do I have any pictures for this? Go with this one and we'll see if the video is next. Okay, so a lot of those maintenance shots you saw were inside this thing they call the heritage hangar. And the guys moving the, the aircraft around on the side are actually employees of the, of the Spitfire operation. Um, for a little bit less money, I could have flown a P-51 Mustang. But this was a 60th birthday present to myself that I sort of looked at doing back in the summer and said, hey, you only live once. So I have this now in my logbook. Um, please join me for a three minute ride. Um, I did my best since I knew a camera was on me to have my Top Gun Maverick face the whole time and not freak out. Um, so I didn't play the camera at all. But there were three things that, that I remember. The most, visible, vis the most visceral one was when they started the engine. And, uh, and you're just, you're, there's a sensory overload. The plane wraps around you, it moves, it shakes, it smells. It, it's really, it's nothing, like nothing I've ever done before. Um, the second thing that happened was as I'm flying, I'm simply so caught up in the moment that I'm not really, not really, I'm, I'm like, there's so much going on. I was not, not present in the way I should have been like, he asked me what altitude we were at, and I could look at the screen. I couldn't. Which one's the altitude? I mean, I felt really behind the airplane the whole time. Those of you who are pilots, you'll appreciate that. So apparently, I have to do it again. Uh, don't tell my wife. Um, anyway, so I think the next one is. I think the video. This is three minutes long, um, and I'm talking to this guy. He's prepping me for my flight. His name is Fish. You'll see me call him by name. Um, and again, three minutes. Enjoy. And this is uh, an airport. Uh, it's also a, um, a commercial airport. You see some private jets coming in and out. It services the corporate jets that, that are in Southern London. <laughs> Nonchalant Top Gun face. So the tail flies first at about 50 knots, and then the aircraft lifts off at about 75 or 80. of turns and straight level and then uh, I piloted the plane and we did some uh, victory rolls which are actually quite fun. The plane handles less tender than the Tiger Moth but it's quite responsive. Right there I'm channeling what would Jimmy DiMatteo look like. As a 
opposed to a loop, that's kind of a 1G roll. It's not, I'm not feeling a lot of pressure. We're joined by another Spitfire. You can see him off the right hand side there. And he swings around to the left side and we say goodbye. Pretty sick seeing him flying next to you. That's, uh, that's quite, a, quite a sight. And on our way back to digging, we roll one more time. It was really cool. Finally cracked a smile. And the other pilot who was in the other plane had to view this video and see how the, my pilot did with the crossway. They're very competitive fudge. Yeah. Computer's not quite keeping up with the video all that well, but that's all right. I think you get the picture. Yeah. Live to tell the tale. It really was a trip down memory lane. Um, I appreciate you taking it with me. I apologize how personal this trip, this uh, presentation was because this really was meaningful to me. And I put it together in about seven hours when I got called to, to do this. And it was some work I probably should have done a while ago when I got back from my trip. So I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today. I'll take a question or two, but it's, go ahead, Fred. Uh, did you get to do any moments or loops? No, 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 the only, the only loops we did were the victory rolls. Um, there is a T6 Harvard you can fly and do a little more aerobatics. Go ahead, if, you, if you're interested. There's, I'm going up to Sacramento this summer to do the same thing, actually. Tom Cruise, eat your heart out. <laughs> no. You know, that was fabulous. So I really appreciate you letting me share that. Thank you. I've, I've enjoyed every minute. What I would like to say is that's the kind of thing I think we should integrate into the junior high in elementary school classes, mm -hmm. because I think there's not an emphasis, enough emphasis on how America's contribution to saving most of Europe mm. from, the, from Hitler. Thank you, Dave, that's really thoughtful. Anything else? All right, oh, go ahead. Thanks, Jim. Were Spitfires, they were, the ones they were flying in the war, were they single place or were they dual place? All of them were single place. Um, there might have been some trainers, but none that survived, <laughs> for obvious reasons, maybe. Um, but there are many that are configured for this dual uh, situation, and, and actually, you didn't see the part where, but actually my seat has a, has a lever underneath that raises me up about eight or 10 inches, so, I'm, so I can see out the front. Um, and on the ground, there's very little visibility forward. It's a, it's a real tail dragger. Wayne? Thank you. Um, on that uh, roll, the victory roll, yeah. So were you doing that, or did he? No, he did that, and it's a really unique control column too. Be in that um, only the top of it, only the top of the stick. It's not a stick like you would a traditional stick. The top of it went left and right like that to handle your your wings, and it went forward and aft for your for your pitch control. It's like a weird setup, but it, it worked. And you're a pilot, so um, when you take out a plane, have you ever? done a roll or wanted to do a roll? I've done some aerobatics, uh, never by myself, I, and never on purpose. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to ask, were, were you flying most of the time? So they did the takeoff and landing. In the Spitfire, I flew less than I flew in the Tiger Moth. I flew the Tiger Moth most of the time. In the Spitfire, he demonstrated some maneuvers and I did them. I think they're very, they take care of their planes and they don't want yahoos jumping in them and turning them hard because they, they very are, you don't pull too many G's in them. Um, when they do fly in the shows, the guys, you know, put them through their paces and they do sort of this, this they, they mock, they have a couple of German planes come in and they blow some stuff up on the ground and then they two Spitfires chase them around. It, it's quite fun and it's definitely worth, worth, if you're in the area, it's definitely worth checking it out. And thank you for letting me share it with you. It means a lot. Thank you, Bill. I'm surprised that uh, with the other Spitfire up there that, that the, the two uh, instructor pilots didn't just tell you to sit down, shut up, and then turn into each other. That would have been a good, that would have been a good trip. Anyway, uh, on behalf of your own club, uh, I want to once again to thank you for stepping up. And I, for one, of course, I love airplanes. spent my whole life uh, either flying or developing them, so uh, I liked it a lot. So, <laughs> For those of you that were more interested in having a presentation on the latest uh, insurance policies and whatnot, we'll, we'll take care of you in coming weeks. Uh, 
anyway, with that, um, I, I want to, uh, next week, a little different pace. We're going to, we're, we're hosting the uh, district speech contest, four-way speech contest, which, which is a great honor, by the way, uh, to host it in our club. And we're going to be doing that at the Coronado Cage Yacht Club, but we're going to start 15 minutes early. And we're going to, you'll, you'll hear this several times before we get to uh, next Wednesday, but, but, um, but, but hear it uh, uh, directly here now. So we'll be starting uh, lunch at 11.45 and the uh, program at 12.15, not 12.30 as we usually do. It should be a great, uh, a great uh, event. So in the meantime, uh, please go out and have a fantastic Coronado Rotary Week and remember service above self.